Max Highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Hello from Berlin and thanks for joining us today. We have loads in store for you in the programme and here's a taster of what's to come. Future fashion, step out in style with smart fabrics. Submerged show, Sue Austin performs underwater in her wheelchair. The presence of Picasso, the Spanish master's favourite haunts in southern France. We start off by looking into the future of fashion. Several designers have been presenting innovative ideas at the world's leading trade show for consumer electronics here in Berlin. It might sound like an unusual place to preview fashion trends, but believe it or not, clothes crafted from high-tech fabrics are a big feature of the show. More and more designers are branching into high-tech fusion like this. One is Austrian Wolfgang Langeder. Back home in the city of Linz, he works for his label Utopa on a diverse men's collection of clothes made from smart textiles. I'm interested in what's new. New possibilities, new things that broaden the horizon. I want to discover new areas in fashion, like on the Starship Enterprise. First, Langader tests his collection. These are samples not yet outfitted with electronics. There's this water-resistant wool jacket. This business suit from specially woven cotton. And this coat. They're just prototypes, all soon to be technologically enhanced with battery, sensors and a phone connection, like this finished sports coat. It lights up when you move or when your phone rings. Inside, there's a hidden network of sophisticated technology, unusual terrain for a fashion designer. You have to bring a certain understanding of the world of electronics with you and an openness to embracing it. That's not really a prerequisite in fashion design, but it's necessary to do what I do. The technical details are worked out by professionals. For three years, Wolfgang Langender has worked with researchers at the Fraunhofer Institute. It was one of their inventions that made his fashion possible. Normally, electronics on so-called circuit boards are stiff and unflexible. Now they can be made with soft, washable foil, complete with electricity, LED lights and sensors. The technology can be ironed onto any material, opening up whole new markets in fashion. I think privately in the street, we could have clothes that connect us more with our surroundings. That means building in sensors connected to our phones and thus to the internet so we can make use of different functions. Some of those functions are already available, like this jacket from an American label. Putting on the hood lets you connect to your Facebook account. A Swiss brand sells these battery-powered self-warming gloves. And even the extravagant world of luxury fashion is starting to experiment with LED lights, like this dress from the label Moon Berlin. Wolfgang Langender now wants to take his high-tech fashion from the runway to the streets. His 20-piece men's collection is inspired in part by nature. The illuminating power of deep-sea creatures gives him new ideas on how to combine electronics with clothing. It could be a complete surface of a jacket or pants that plays video, or pictures just like on a screen. It works like a computer screen, which is rigid. Only I would wear it on my body and could change it around. That's important. His creations could cost up to 2,500 euros. He's already found interested buyers for his Utopa collection, and he hopes to exhibit it in Milan and Paris early next year. 
Now, mixing music genres can be a risky undertaking. Classical and pop music don't normally blend that well together, but Germany's Eberhard Schoener has successfully amalgamated the two in numerous concerts over the last four decades. His latest project premiered at the Tegernsee Music Festival in Bavaria, and the crowds packed in to hear it. It's the premiere of avant-garde composer Eberhard Schoener's latest work. Called Traumfahrer der Musik, or Dream Paths of Music, the composition blends Bavarian folk music, classical, and jazz. One of the basics of Schoener's music is the mixing of different genres. There is nothing worse than stagnation. As in architecture, when different elements are put together, one person does concrete, another uses bricks, and a third wood, you need a mix. It's all our material and you use material. Everything is available, or should be. That's one of my working principles. At a rehearsal at Tegernsee Lake in Bavaria, some 120 musicians gather. They're all part of the show, which includes a symphony orchestra, a pop band, and a choir. The lineup includes music greats such as jazz organist Barbara Denneline and Scottish bassist for the 1960s rock supergroup Cream, Jack Bruce. Schoener worked for a year to create the two-hour show, but the 74-year-old composer says he's relatively calm ahead of the premiere. I've directed more than 300 operas at Munich's Royal Palace. Of course it's exciting. But if I ever looked nervous, it would look bad with more than 100 people on stage. In the 1970s, Schoener started his career in experimental music. He studied conducting and violin, mixing rock with classic, and produced his first world music, as he called it, in 1976. At a concert with Balinese musicians, he mixed European sound with that of East Asia. The composer has also scored films and television series, collaborated with bands including The Police, and written operas. Starting in 2001, he began integrating the virtual world into his compositions. He had musicians record and upload their parts for the opera Vertopera. More than 1,500 people attended the premiere performance that evening. Wild. Super. It's rare to sit through a long concert without looking at your watch. Enchanting. The atmosphere was great. It didn't rain. Great entertainment. What can I say? Wonderful. Even after more than 40 years as a composer, Eberhard Schoener still manages to delight audiences with his experiments. This summer, the British capital has been running the London 2012 Cultural Festival alongside the Olympic and Paralympic Games. The festival, which wraps up this weekend, featured some 12,000 events, including a fascinating underwater performance from wheelchair user Sue Austin. Underwater, Sue Austin can fly. The British artist performs with her wheelchair amidst coral and fish. It's the most incredible sense of freedom. There is nothing else like it I've experienced in life. More than 15 years ago, Sue Austin lost the use of her legs after a serious illness. She's been confined to a wheelchair ever since. A psychologist by training, she began looking for creative ways to deal with her new situation. And seven years ago, came up with the idea of underwater ballet in a wheelchair. 
rather than it being ballet or dance or a very controlled performance, live art is about working in unexpected environments. It's about exciting and inspiring people by taking a situation that most people might think is restricting and turning it into something beyond what most people will consider doing. We're attending a live performance of Sue Austin's art at a pool in Portland in southern England. It's one of a series of cultural events associated with the Paralympics taking place in London. Some members of the audience even play a role in the performance. They actually settle down on the floor of the pool to watch Austin's performance. Like the artist, they're also wearing oxygen tanks. There isn't really any way of describing what it feels like to have this wheelchair float directly in front of you. It's utterly mesmerising. I think any mermaid should watch her back. <laughs> it's the first time I've been diving anyway. I was underwater, taking photos, watching this woman go round, floating around in a wheelchair, you know, it's just bizarre. Most of the Paralympics are taking place in London. The Games have attracted more international interest than ever before. Tickets to many of the events are sold out. We've come to see um, basketball and goalball and football and tennis. They have disabilities, which makes it more interesting, and so it's harder for them, and their past makes it a bit more fun to watch. My brother-in-law is uh, he's not a Paralympic. He doesn't do Olympics, <laughs> but he's uh, partially disabled, so that's why they're special for us. The cultural Olympiad which accompanies the Games is also very popular. The South Bank Centre, in the heart of London, is hosting a festival entitled Unlimited. Here, 29 artists from around the globe exhibit their works and musicians give daily performances. All the artists taking part have some kind of disability. For us, we're looking for great art, regardless of the backgrounds or um, sort of, I suppose, communities that the artists are coming from. Sue Austin has also come to London to see the festival. A film showing her latest performance is part of the program. People get so excited and inspired about by this particular piece of work that that on its own makes people say, if you can do that, I can do anything. Sue Austin is already planning her next challenge, embarking on a world tour with her underwater ballet. A truly inspiring story. But moving on, we head to the Italian capital of style, Milan, to view the latest exhibition by internationally celebrated photographer Peter Lindbergh. Titled The Known and the Unknown, Lindbergh has created a series of photos with a backdrop of science fiction. And we were at the opening to take a look. Fashion photographs set in front of a mysterious backdrop, a meeting of humans and alien beings. The idea was a joke that came about during a fashion shoot. The hairstylist Julien said, look here, let's put something white on his head, like a long egg. And suddenly we thought, well, let's turn the whole thing around. Now it looks like a creature from who knows where, and not a person. It's someone from another planet, and wherever it walks, everything tips over and explodes. And that was the idea. That idea eventually became The Unknown, a series of photos taken at fashion shoots over a number of years, all set against the vision of a fictitious landing of beings from outer space. The collection is now on view in Europe for the first time, featuring 40 photographs at the Carla Sozzani Gallery in Milan. The images are arrayed like a serial novel, an idea inspired by a spread Lindbergh did for a fashion magazine. 
Ja, ich muss dann sagen wir mal 20, 25, 30. Man hätte 20, 25, 30 Pages für Vogue. Und in den 30 Seiten. In 30 Pages, you can really tell a story. Was schön, das ist unterhaltsam. Every page features a different item of clothing. Jede Seite hat ein andere, ein anderes Kleid. And in the end, we call it a fashion shoot. Nennt man das Modefotos zum Schluss, ne? The second part of the Milan exhibition is called The Known. It features many of the works that brought Peter Lindbergh international fame. Photographs of models like Linda Evangelista and Kate Moss. Lindbergh has always rejected the sterile images familiar from fashion photography. He wants to depict authenticity and emotions, even in shoots with supermodels like Nadja Auermann. We have these photos that you made. And we took these photos at night in front of a small wooden garage door in the middle of nowhere in the desert. It was so intense. We didn't speak, we just took photos. It was so intense that in the end, Nadia wept with the tears just streaming down. Lindbergh was 27 years old when he discovered the world of photography. He grew up in Duisburg. He started out doing odd jobs as a decorator and learned how to sketch on the side. He began taking photographs on his travels through Morocco. And then he formally learned the trade as assistant to a photographer. It was a total coincidence. It could have all gone so differently. I said I wanted to try photography, but he was very nice about it. A year and a half later, I said I can do it. Today, exhibitions of works by Lindbergh are celebrated events. His fans and the media throng to these openings to greet both him and his work. Lindbergh is a public figure, but he also has an unknown side. It's my little secret. I enjoy being alone. I work a lot at night, and every day I need four or five hours to myself. If I didn't have that, I'd just shrivel up. And in fact, he had precious little time for himself at the opening party in Milan. But Peter Lindbergh didn't seem to mind. Now, every year in autumn, the German city of Bonn hosts a big festival honouring Ludwig van Beethoven in the city of his birth. This year, the conductor of the Birmingham Symphony Orchestra opened the concert series called Beethoven Fest. Deutsche Welle supports the event, so Euromax had an exclusive backstage pass. <laughs> Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is known the world over. This year it featured at the opening concert of the Beethoven Festival in Bonn, in a performance by the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra under the direction of Latvian conductor Andris Nelsons. Just a few hundred meters away on Münster Square, thousands of people watched the concert at a public viewing. Beethoven holds a special place here. It is the city where he was born. I think playing in Bonn, it's a feeling that Beethoven is certainly present himself, and that's more, more, more nervous, of course, or more stressful, of course. But, but, uh, I mean, Beethoven, I think he's probably one of the most lovable composers for of all times for all people, and also for me, and uh, a big genius. The square began to fill up in the afternoon. A three-hour Deutsche Welle program gave background information and a glimpse of the festival's highlights to set the mood for the evening. Technically, it's superb. The sound is just like in a concert hall, and the screen is good, too. I didn't know that so many people would be interested in the Beethoven. I mean, I guess this is Bonn, but it seems like the... Um, the public is very interested. It's a big turnout. It's fantastic here. Wonderful weather and the Beethoven Festival. I'm from Bonn, so it's very special to me. The Beethoven Festival has Bonn in a celebratory mood. The city will host about 2,000 artists during the coming four weeks, among them many famous names and promising newcomers. Deutsche Welle is a traditional festival partner. 
Deutsche Welle's brief is to report about Germany as a European nation of culture. And without a doubt, Beethoven plays a prominent role in music all over the world. The festival's motto is, art has a mind of its own. It's presenting artists who stubbornly go their own way, like their great predecessor. Beethoven is everywhere in Bonn. I've just come back from walking around uh, Beethoven's house. Um, so to go from there straight to here um, to sing is just wonderful. ones who don't know about music, they know Beethoven Ninth Symphony and this, is, this brings all thousands of people together and uh, this is what we need nowadays in this life where music can bring people together and be a strong power to unite the souls of human beings. And the Ode to Joy marks a promising beginning for the Beethoven Festival. Pablo Picasso spent many years along the French Riviera and in Provence. We take a trip around the south of France now to discover the remaining presence of the master painter in a region that long served him as a source of inspiration. There are still areas in southern France that resemble paradise. The Luberon region is known for its idyllic vineyards, mountain parks and medieval villages with evocative names like Bonneu, Lacoste, Oped, or God. The best known is probably Ménerbe, population 1200. One of the most beautiful houses in Ménerbe is named Doramar, after the owner who made it famous. At the entrance, there's a photo of Mar taken when she was young, when she was Pablo Picasso's lover, model, and photographer. There's also a photograph of Picasso taken by Mar. Picasso frequently sketched or painted portraits of his muse. She lived here in this house with Picasso until they parted ways. As a separation gift, he left the house here to Doramar. That was back in 1944. In addition to photographs, the house also contains a few of her paintings. After Mar's death in 1997, the house was sold and renovated. Today, it's a residence for artists, sponsored by an American foundation. Picasso loved the Côte d'Azur and the towns and villages like Antibes, with its unmistakable silhouette. One of the best-known landmarks in Antibes is the medieval Chateau Grimaldi. For nearly 50 years, it's also been known as the Picasso Museum. Pablo Picasso discovered the town of Antibes in 1946 and decided to set up a studio here in Chateau Grimaldi to work on his art. The museum shows some of the works that Picasso created here in the space of just a few months. Antibes' Mediterranean flair clearly inspired the bright sky, the blue sea and the color of the beach in his painting Joie de Vivre. His ceramic figures aren't from Antibes. They were created in Valoris, a village high above the sea. Valoris has a centuries-old pottery industry. At the age of 66, Picasso came here and started learning about the art from experienced potters at the Madura studio. One of those pottery makers was Dominique Sassi. He worked with Picasso for more than 20 years. A few of his works from that period can be seen at the Picasso Museum in Valoris. Picasso didn't come to Valoris by mistake. This was a pottery-making capital where he found a wealth of forms. In Valoris, Picasso met Jacqueline Roque, whom he married at City Hall in 1961. Diagonally below the town hall, in the small marketplace, stands a bronze sculpture entitled Man with Lamb. It was a gift from Picasso to the residents of the town. 
The chateau in Valoris contains what may be the most spectacular reminder of Picasso, a painting entitled War and Peace. Picasso discovered this space in 1947 when he first visited the pottery-making town. He was still affected by the events of the war and wanted to express that with this huge mural. It's Picasso's largest painting. When asked about the chapel painting, Picasso reportedly said that if peace ever conquered the world, the war that he painted would become a part of the past. And that is all we have time for today. So thanks for watching, everyone. And until next time, take care and goodbye. <laughs>